That time now once again For getting lumped up with my friends It's rock a mic And Rob that you should know And you'll find them here on the rock show Ooh, yeah, on the rock show Good morning, Mike. How are you doing today? All right, Rob. How are you? So this is another edition of The Rock Show. This is episode 143, and we're talking about The Replacement. This is yep. a band from Minnesota, right? Yeah, they're from Minneapolis, uh, The Replacements. I think they're one of the most important bands of the 80s. Uh, they definitely... You, you know, it's funny. I don't know if you, if you, if you, when you were researching it, if you caught how they were very influenced by Big Star. Oh yeah, did Big you, Star that we talked yeah. about a long time ago. Yeah, yeah, we did a great show on Big Star last year, and I think that uh, if anybody kind of picked up where Big Star left off, it's the Replacements more than any other band I can think of. Mike, what yeah. band did we talk about the other? Wasn't the last band we talked about was from Minnesota too? Who's could do? Yeah, last yeah. week's uh, the Who's could do episode from last week. These guys were, you know, friendly rivals, friends. You know, uh, the the replacements have a song called "Something to Do," and they spell "do" like "du," like "Who's could do." You know, okay. it was just, uh, <laughs> you know, they were both kind of like coming up around the same time. Uh, in the punk scene in Minneapolis and they kind of both went different directions, but they both did their own thing after a while. They kind of got bigger than that scene, you know? So it was cool. So probably two of the best bands to come out of, of, of Minnesota, as far as I'm concerned, who's could do and, and the replacements, you know, it's, it's kind of cold up there. I guess they don't get out too much. I know, <laughs> <laughs> but you you've been to you've been to Minneapolis, right? Yeah, I like it. Minnesota's all right. It's cold, but it's nice. It's a lot of country. So mm -hmm. everybody works in the city, and they go to uh, suburbia. They, right, they work in town, and then they go home. Yeah, they don't really live in Minneapolis too much, right? Yeah, it's like Seattle. Seattle's the same way. A lot of people live outside, and they come into the city and work, and then they go back home. Right, right, right. All right, so let's get into this. Um, all right, now. The Replacements were obviously an American rock band formed in Minneapolis in 1979. Um, original members were guitarist and vocalist Paul Westerberg, Bobby Stinson on guitar, um, and his brother Tommy Stinson was on bass, uh, drummer Chris Mars. Okay. Now, The Replacements music was really mostly influenced by, I mentioned, Big Star, uh, the Stones, the Beatles were big influences. Slade, okay. Uh, Creedence Clearwater Revival. Then uh, they had their big punk influences like the Ramones, the Sex Pistols, the Damned. They were big New York Dolls fans. Um, you know, they have a song called Johnny's Gonna Die, which is about Johnny Thunders from the New York Dolls. Um, they were a notorious live act, okay, to see because they were very unpredictable. Um, a lot of times they were lumped up on stage, okay, and they would stagger around and, and fuck around and fall down and, you know, all kinds of funny stuff would happen. Um, they were like more like rock and roll because they called them, they even called them alternative. I don't know, I don't see them being alternative, but they were definitely you know, like it, it's just college, rock and roll. college pop, definitely college. Co uh, well, you remember this was the 80s, okay, yeah. so you, do, you didn't have those terms. You didn't have alternative music. They didn't, yeah. That word wasn't used. So, you know, their early stuff borderlines on, on on straight punk rock influenced by the bands I just mentioned, okay? Yeah. But, th but then, you know, they had songs at that time, too, that were just straight-ahead rocker songs, something like maybe the Stones would put out, okay? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. They were yeah, probably... and, and they, they, they kind of did it in a way. They they, they, they covered all those, those little sub-genres, but... And they did get picked up on college radio. So co college rock, that term, yeah. uh, existed in the in, by the by the mid '80s. You started hearing that, but they were already around for a couple of years. 
So, you know, had they come out 10 years later, they would have fell into that whole alternative music scene. But they were one of these why. bands I that you... I don't consider what? them alternative at all. No, they were, they were before that. They you were know, rock they, and roll. They were rock, rock and roll. roll. Yeah, no, just, just, yeah. Well, I mean, that's the problem with labels. You know, you, 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 a bands like The Replacements, you can't pigeonhole into one category. Yeah. You know, so it's just rock and roll. I mean, alternative is just supposed to be rock and roll too. I mean, you know, yeah. but it's just that would when you when you start. I, I try to stay away from that. I don't like all these names. It's just all under rock and roll. All right, that's it. Yeah. So, um, you know, and you know their live shows. I I did see them live. Uh, and one one time I saw them, they were very drunk, drinking on stage, and uh, you know, a lot of times they would they would not even play their own music they might if they felt like doing three covers in a row they would do three three someone else's shit you know in a row they just did whatever they wanted you know on stage so i think that's pretty funny <laughs> it, it is it is because a lot of a lot of their a lot of their shows were sloppy and they especially early on and they uh it would hurt them in some ways too when it came down to getting good record contracts and stuff but they were just a fun band. I'll just leave it at that, you know. Now, they the band actually began in 1978 when 19-year-old guitar player Bobby Stinson gave 11-year-old Tommy Stinson, okay, keep in mind he's 11, okay, yeah. um, gave him his first bass guitar. And he basically gave it to him just to keep him off the streets, okay, because Bobby, Bobby played guitar and he was he was a few years older than him. And he just gave his brother a bass so he wouldn't get in trouble. So um, that year, Bob met high school dropout Chris Mars. Now, um, Bobby and Tommy asked him to join a band. It would be a trio. Uh, so Mars would switch from guitar to drums. Okay. So now you got, you got Bobby on guitar. You got Tommy on bass. You got Chris on, on drums. And the, the band was called Dog Breath that they put together. And they really just I were a cover like band. That name. It, it is a good name. It's, it's, not, like it's it. not a bad name. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, especially for the time, it was like, what? You know, Dog Breath? What the fuck? You yeah, know? It sounds, but, sounds good, man. Sounds yeah, but they were, a co they, they were a covers band. And they didn't have a singer. So what they did was they would cover classic rock songs um, instrumentally. Okay, they, I mean, they would go out and do an Aerosmith song, and it would just be the music. Okay, so but this guy, this guy, he was young, man, eleven year old, eleven years old. <laughs> he's like my age. Star. Stay out of the street, kid. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's he's like he's like my age. Like I I I mean, I wish somebody when I was eleven had to be a bass and said, yeah, you it's know, crazy. I'm I'm, I'm shocked my by that. Like when I read that, I was like, damn, this kid was young. Yeah, yeah, and that would come up later too, when when they begin touring and stuff. You, you'll see. I'll tell I'll tell you about it. So one day they were practicing in the Stinson's house, and Paul Westerberg, who was a janitor in the area, okay, he worked in the area for a U.S. senator that had an office nearby, and he was walking home from his janitor job, and he heard some guys jamming outside a house. So he was actually impressed by what he heard, and he kind of sat back and listened a little bit. And every day he would walk that way afterwards to, to catch them practicing all the time. You know, he'd hear them. So um, Mars actually, Chris Mars actually knew Paul, okay? And Paul, though, didn't know that he was in that particular band that he was hearing. Yeah, so one like day, he had no clue. He didn't, he didn't have any clue about that, but he knew he was in a band, but he didn't know it was what he was hearing every day after work. OK, so um, he asked him to, to come down and hang out, jam a little bit. Paul played guitar. Um, he didn't make any motion yet that he was could sing, too. OK, so they they were actually looking for a singer, but they didn't ask Paul at that point. And they ended up getting this guy. um I think I think his name is lost to history. They ended up getting a, a singer, and but Paul kind of really wanted to be the singer of the band. And what he did was he took the guy to the side, and he said, "You know, 
the band hates you. <laughs> the band doesn't like you. Okay. And the guy got all upset and he and he ended up leaving the band and Paul took over. That's how we that's how we got into the into the replacements. Okay. That's they weren't called funny, they were man. still called dog breath though. They were still called dog breath at that point. Uh we but, like you. <laughs> yeah, we you know it's like like kids, right? It's funny. Uh <laughs> They were still called Dog Breath, but they decided, let's change the name, okay? Um, but they didn't have an idea yet. So before Paul, they used to get drunk or take various drugs at rehearsals. What was happening was, you know, the music was kind of second to partying, okay? Yeah. But once he got into the band, they got more disciplined because he wanted, you know, Paul wanted to write songs and be more serious with the practicing and eventually you know, make that a career. That's what he wanted to do. Yeah, so, so he, he's probably the one that he's the guy that pretty much put the band together and fixed them up. Well, yeah, I mean, they weren't as serious until he got into the band. And uh, then just he was a bit of a drill sergeant, I guess, you know, and kind of got them practicing and all that. Sometimes you need that. You know, bands do need that sometimes, especially when you got a lot of guys in the band that like to party. You know, it's like, OK, everyone's hanging out. We need to be practicing, you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, like Ace from uh, Kiss. <laughs> right, or jo Johnny Johnny Ramone and the Ramones, you know, he, yeah. was, he, was, he was the drill sergeant. So um, Westerberg actually not only gave him some discipline, he, he gave them some new influences. He turned them on to all the punk rock that was out there at the time, stuff like The Clash, The Sex Pistols, The Ramones. The Jam. The Jam, the jam. right, right, The Dam, all that cock. stuff. Yep, yep. And you could hear the buzzcocks in their music. You could definitely hear the buzzcocks. Yeah. They're very yeah. similar. Very similar. So the name change that they would go to first would be called the Impediments. Okay. <laughs> That's an awful name. Yeah, it's kind of bad. Dog the breath impediments. Is <laughs> but they played one drunken gig as the Impediments, and that was in uh, June of 1980. Uh, Tommy Stinson... Missed this gig for some reason. He was probably he was still in school. Probably had something to do with that. Uh, they were playing in a church that used to allow music in as well, and they were so drunk and disorderly they got banned from there forever after the gig. <laughs> but they they ended up uh, saying, "Nah, that this impediment's name is no good either. Let's call ourselves the Replacements," and they got that from the idea of like, you know. A band was going was going to go on. You were going to go see them, and they didn't make it. So, they, in come these guys, the replacements, the shitty band that you didn't want to see. Okay, so it's kind of like an inside joke with them. Yeah, but, you know, but um, you know, it worked. It just worked for them. So the replacements would record a four song demo in the basement of Chris Mars's house. Uh, they would pass the demo on to a guy named Peter Jesperson. In May of 1980. Now, Jesperson, um, he he managed the uh, what was called the Or Folk Joke Opus, okay, and that was a punk rock record store in yeah. in uh, Minneapolis that everybody kind of gathered around from the scene. Uh, he also was the founder of Twin Tone Records uh, with a guy named Paul Stark, who was a local recording engineer, and another guy named Charlie Hallman, uh, Hallman as a as a partner, okay? Westerberg gave Jesperson the tape of the demos, hoping to get a gig at a place called Jay's Longhorn Bar, which was a local rock venue where Jeff Jesperson sometimes was a DJ there. So that's what he was hoping for. But when Jesperson listened to the first track, which was Raised in the City, that's the name of the song, Yeah, uh, he, was, he was blown away by it. Uh, he ended up calling Westerberg the next day and asked if they wanted to record a full album or just singles. That's how he was he was ecstatic about it. So they ended up signing to Twin Tone in May of 1980. Uh, basically, it was a handshake deal. OK, yeah. they really didn't have it, it, They didn't really have a written contract. OK. Um, and they played their first gig at the uh, Jay's Longhorn Bar in July. Of 1980, July 2nd, actually. Okay. Now, after they signed to Twin Tone, Westerberg started writing a lot of new songs. And soon he had a whole album of material. The guy was very quick in his writing. Uh, a few weeks after 
their live debut in July, they felt they were ready to start recording. So Peter Jesperson, who is now managing them as well, okay? So this uh, guy Stettel, not only got them, but he's now managing them, and he's yeah, also I mean, the he guy took, with the record took, label, right? He took the full reins, yeah. He's the record label, he's the manager, he'll produce them too, okay? So, um, he, he, you know, he was managing them now, and he settled them into a studio called Blackberry Way. It was an eight-track home studio, somebody's house, in Minneapolis. Um, however, the studio time that they got was kind of intermittent, so it took them about six months to record this record. All right, which is kind of long for a band like that. But that well, was the only way they could do it. Was getting free um, recording studio time, right? Probably or, cheap, or you mm -hmm. know, cheap time, cheap time maybe. Yeah. Sometimes. You know, bands that are already recording might have leftover time and, and another band will, will take that time, you know, for free. So um, they had the album recorded after six months. But Twin Tone Records at that time was just getting off the ground and they couldn't afford to release the record. Um, it got held back until August of 1981. So it really was like a year, OK, to get that album out. Uh, but they did everything themselves, and it was a small label, and I, th I think the band li liked that. They didn't want to deal with a major label. They didn't trust uh, record companies and stuff, and I guess they just didn't have a problem. Remember, Tommy Stinson was still in school. Yeah. Okay, so, you know, they probably were. But technically, were... the still didn't have a contract with. Um... No, they never, they never, they never had a, a real written contract with the label, okay, which – you know, that's good and bad, I guess. Yeah, okay? that's good and bad, because how do you get paid? <laughs> well, I mean, you get paid because you trust the guy, you hope he pays you, but if he doesn't, then that could be a problem because there's no yeah. contract. You know, but they, they, you know, Jesperson showed a lot of interest right away in the band. I guess they got a good vibe off the guy. I don't yeah. know, different, different Sometimes times. Sometimes you, you get know? lucky like that. Yeah, I mean, nobody would do that today, but different no. times, you know? So um, the debut album was, I mean, I love this title. It is probably my favorite album from yeah. them, too. Uh, the debut album is called Sorry, Ma, Forgot to Throw Out the Trash. Okay. And it was released on Twin Tone August 25th, 1981. So we just, you know, we just passed the 40-year anniversary of that album. Uh, the, the band became popular with the Minneapolis hardcore punk scene, and they quickly became friendly rivals with Who's Could Do like we talked about earlier, okay? Uh, in fact, um, there is the track Something to Do, like I mentioned, and it's a reference to the band. They spell it D-U with the little dots on top. Uh, there's a song called Johnny's Gonna Die on that album, and that was a tribute to Johnny Thunders. Yeah. It was a major influence on them. Um, other replacement classics on there, like Raised in the City, Taking a Ride, I Hate Music, uh, you know, great songs all on that album. Now, selling well locally, but not nationally, okay, the album was still well critically received. Yeah. Uh, cr critics that got copies of it did talk about it and said, hey, you know, there's something going on in Minneapolis, all right, between Who's Could Do and The Replacements. Yeah. Okay. So sometime in late 1981, uh, Peter Jesperson heard the band perform a new song, okay, called Kids Don't Follow. And he was convinced it could be a hit and wanted to get it out there. Uh, he pleaded with his twin tone partners, Stark and Holman, to try to get this song released, okay? He said he would personally hand stamp any record jackets that needed to be stamped, okay, to get it out if he had to, okay? So they agreed to, to fund the recording of... Uh, but what would happen is Jesperson would actually have to hold up to his agreement and hand stamp 10,000 copies of the record. OK, wow. you got all what I mean by hand stamp is is the record jacket was a simple white sleeve. Yeah. And they the if you look at the, the name of the album, it was, it was really an EP. OK, that that came out with that song on it and it was called Stink. OK, so you had it said the replacements stink yeah. okay <laughs> okay and it was stamped 
onto the onto the and he had to personally do that. Okay, so we got wow. all his friends. Everybody all got together and I guess in his house or whatever and just and did it. <laughs> did it, you know. So um eight tracks on the EP. It's almost an LP. Okay, but it, they yeah. called it an EP. Uh, Why did they call it an EP? Yeah, that's like yeah. I don't, I don't know. Like... Eight, eight, eight tracks. You could call it an album. Yeah, I don't, yeah. I don't really know. They just because the songs were short. You know, I guess it wasn't even a half an hour long. But that was like a punk album almost. You know, it was short and sweet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But they called it an EP. I don't know. Okay. Um, Kids don't follow was on there. That was the main one that they wanted to get out. Uh, other tracks like fuck school. Uh, dope smoking man. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, great. dope, 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 dope smoking moron. I'm sorry. Uh, before the opening track of Kids Don't Follow, you could actually hear the police. There's a, they used a, a tape that they had of the police, the NYP, no, no NYP, the Minneapolis Police Department. Yeah. Okay. Uh, breaking up a rent party that they were at. Okay. At a place called the Harmony Building in Minneapolis. Um, at one point in the crowd, that are being told to leave. You could you could hear someone curse the police, and it's actually uh, Dave Primer from the band Soul Asylum. <laughs> okay, so um, after the release of Stink, the replacements began to kind of distance distance themselves a bit from the punk scene. All right, they wanted yeah. to kind of get out of that. They didn't want to be pigeonholed in that one category. So being influenced by other, you know, rock subgenres, they wanted to write more serious songs, not just riffs with statements. OK, that's what, what Paul Westerberg said in an interview. OK, he said, you know, we write songs, not just riffs with statements. So some stuff that Westerberg was writing at the time were even uh, acoustic ballads and different things. Um, the band, when he started playing stuff like that for him, for them, they would usually tell him, no, we're not doing that. Save that for your solo record. OK, but, <laughs> you know, he was he was coming out with all different kinds of stuff. He wanted to 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 make the band more than just a punk band. OK, now with a with a batch of new songs under its belt, the replacements entered a warehouse in Roseville, Minnesota, to record their next album, which was called Hootenanny. I love that um, title. Yeah, it is. Great title, great album. Great album. Yeah. Um, hold on a second. Oh, I am so hungover. I'm doing this totally hungover today. <laughs> Me too, man. I got yeah. looked up last night. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Vodka's been kicking my ass lately. I don't know what it is. <laughs> anyway. Is that the devil vodka? The 100 no, that's gone. Oh, <laughs> no, I, that, that, that's that's gone a couple of weeks already. That 151 proof vodka. I was, oh my God. <laughs> so, Hoot Nanny came out again on Twin Tone. Okay. Uh, it was produced by, um, by uh, Jesperson. And uh, co owner Paul Stark was engineering the record as well. Uh, Westerberg wrote the album kind of in fits and starts. It took him a while to, to, to write this record. Uh, and it took several sessions for them to finish the album as well. But uh, it's, it was worth the time. Uh, Hootenanny uh, was the band's second studio album, uh, and it was released in April of 1983. Okay. Um, when I say second album, I mean full length. They did have that EP in between. Okay. This was quite different. Hoot Nanny than anything they had done. Yeah, before. this was like a more they were like more adult, more grown up music and a lot more mature, a lot more mature, showing a lot more influences than they had in the past. Uh you know, yeah. everything everything from from rockabilly to punk and you know, more straight ahead rock songs and things like that. Uh there's a track on there on that album uh that I love called Willpower. Yeah. And there's a lot of like echoed vocals in the background um the arrangement is very simple on the song um and it just it's a powerful song when you when you hear it but mike i think this is the um album that put them on the mat because like they were getting radio play they were yeah. they were all over the place yeah yeah it got it got play at over 200 radio stations across the country yeah uh probably more like college radio and stuff like that but still yeah okay they, they were starting to get out there um, the Village Voice actually here in New York actually caught wind of them 
Yeah. Okay. Uh, Robert Christgau called it the most critically independent album of 1983. Now wow. that, you know, that kind of quote now may not mean anything, but back in 83, you started seeing independent labels popping up twin tone. Well, they've always been there, but yeah. a lot of underground music was, was, was out there on the indie labels. Okay. You know, in New, in New York at the time you had Sonic youth, uh, yeah. you know, who's could do and, and the replacements in the Midwest like that. Uh, bands from, uh, uh california were on small labels you had the sst label the black flag label okay they, these were all independently put out so chris gal was saying the most independent that meaning like probably the best out of all the indie yeah. labels at the time you know now, the now, now they're kind of growing bigger than minnesota now they're known outside minnesota yeah. they're going through the united states now to be you know yeah yeah they would right what would happen is um they started getting recognized outside of the Minneapolis, Minnesota area. They decided to do their first major U S tour. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, to do it, Tommy, who was in 10th grade, he dropped out of, out of high school. Shocking. Okay? <laughs> I mean, I guess I get it. You know what I mean? Why not? Okay. Could always go back if it falls apart. Yeah. You know, but he, uh, he dropped out of school to do that tour. Wow. Right. And they played, they hit the East Coast, okay? And they played gigs at Trenton City Gardens in New Jersey. Uh, they played Maxwell's in Hoboken. That was a club I used to go to a lot. I like Maxwell's. Um, and there was a place on West 3rd Street that they played their first New York City gig in called Gertie's Folk City. Strange that they played that first. You would think they would have played CB's first, okay? But CB's for some reason came later a little bit later but yeah um gertie's folk city was a place that bob dylan used to play back when he was starting out okay took like 20 years earlier all right so i i guess i i, I don't remember this place too much i think i was there once uh it's not there no more it was kind of like by um on third street the, like where the blue note is like around there you know what I'm talking about? Which one? Uh, Gertie's Folk City down in the village. Do you remember that place? You know what? I don't really remember. I, that. I, I was there. I was there once, I think, but it, it it closed a long time ago. But it was like I say, it was a place where Bob Dylan got his start there and stuff like that. Um, they would return to New York City in June of '83. They would come back to New York after that tour. All right, um, and play Seabees. But this gig was a total flop. Yeah. In fact, the in fact the Gertie's Folk City gig didn't go well either. So, uh, with that place, they they at Gertie's they started playing and and people thought they were too loud and everybody left. All right, but when they played CBs, um, Bobby Stinson got thrown out of the club for being wasted. OK, <laughs> now, I, now, now, if you think about CBGB's and getting thrown out for being wasted, I, I don't know how wasted he was. He I mean, must have been totally everybody, wasted. <laughs> everybody, yeah, like beyond wasted. And they ended up going on last on a Sunday night, which ended up really being like two o'clock in the morning, a Monday morning. OK, yeah. so they played to like an empty house at CBGB's. All right. And uh so they, their first two New York gigs really didn't go well. Um, they did get an eight-date tour after that, later that summer, um, opening for REM. Okay. Uh, the tour, even that tour was not a success as the REM audience really didn't take to them too good. Okay. Um, and they weren't interested in the replacements at all. You know, they didn't show any excitement or anything like that. Uh, morale in the band took a dive. Yeah, all right. so. yeah, I mean, even though they were starting to get recognized nationally, the live shows were suffering. And I think that bothered them because they considered themselves a live band, you know, a, 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 you know, a touring band. OK, um, Paul Westerberg had made a quote about it one time. He said, we'd rather play for 50 people who know us than for a thousand people who don't care. 
Yeah. Okay. Which th that was their attitude. It's, yeah, you get it, you know. Um, so they decided to start working on a new record. All right. And uh, Peter Buck from REM, they had friended the band. Okay. Being on tour with them, even though they didn't do that well. Yeah. Um, he was going to produce the album. OK, but what happened was when they got to Athens, Georgia, where Buck was was headquartered, um, they didn't really have enough material yet to start recording. So um, what they did is they ended up uh, recording with Peter Jesperson again and uh, a guy named Steve Fajelstad. OK, uh, and they, he, the two of them co-produced the album and this new material that Paul would eventually write. Uh, focused very much on on his songwriting, okay, his his abilities, okay, um, and he was getting influenced by a lot of things, stuff, metal, heavy metal, uh, Chicago blues. Um, they were starting to bring pianos and twelve string guitars into their sound a little bit. Uh, Peter Buck actually did contribute on this record. Um, and they even had mandolins and stuff on it. Peter Buck played a little guitar on the track I Will Dare. Uh, Androgynous. Okay, that song had Westerberg on piano. Um, I don't know if you ever hear that song, Androgynous. Joan Jett covers it. Yeah, I have heard that song. That's, 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 a, song. Replacement, that's yeah. a replacement song. Yeah, a lot of people oh, don't know that. Yeah, they think, they, a lot of people think she wrote it. She didn't write that song. So... The album was called Let It Be, okay? <laughs> I think it's funny that they just took a Beatles name. You know, yeah, I, I think they just did on purpose. <laughs> Let It Be. And, you know, it's, if you think about it, if you did that today with the internet, okay, anybody that Googled you, you get the Beatles or you get you, right? Like if people yeah. Google, maybe people looking for the Beatles would get you, you know? Yeah, so, like, they, me. Oh, yeah okay. I don't know. I don't know why they... Yeah, I think it's funny. You know, they just called it that. You know, um, another guy who did something like that was was Gigi Allen. If you remember, we did the show on him. Yeah, he had that. He had that album. You give love a bad name. Yeah, you... <laughs> after the Fat <laughs> Joby song. <laughs> that's that's funny. You know, that's really um, funny. Yeah. Now the album Let It Be was released on October eighty in eighty four. Right away to critical acclaim. Critics love the album. Uh, and major labels were now starting to notice them. Okay. So in 84, the band wasn't doing well financially. Uh, anything, they, any money, profits they made would go right back into recording or touring, you know, whatever they needed. So they really yeah. weren't making a lot of money. And they, they all had day jobs. Um, I think uh, Bobby Stinson was, was, uh, in, working at a pizza place and stuff, you know, they all had different different things going on. Mike, do um, you know that that album was like in the top one hundred of the eighties greatest album? At the end of the eighties, yeah, there was a list of that, and they made it. Yeah, yeah. They made, I, like, I, I mean, Spin I think magazine it, that were number twelve, and uh, yeah. Rolling Stone magazine that were number fifteen. So it was rank up there with like some of the best albums in the eighties. That's pretty incredible. Well, you know, like I said at the beginning of the show, I think they were one of the most important bands of that decade. You know, now another problem they had is the uh, they weren't getting regularly paid from the yeah. record company, and that had to do with some of the distributors not paying Twin Tone, and then they wouldn't get paid in time. So money was a problem, and um, major labels were beginning to become interested in them. Uh, but what what happens is, you know, if a label is interested, you might say, you know, come down to this show, check us out. A lot of times when that happens, they, they had an off night. OK, so they just didn't sound that good uh, or they were drunk and a little sloppy. And, uh, you know, there was a live album that was recorded around this time. Um, it wasn't released for a long time. OK. It didn't come out right away, uh, but it was recorded in 1985. Years later, it would come out. It was called "The Shit Hits the Fans," and if you listen to that record, it's a, it's it's a very sloppy live show. So you, you know, you know what it is. There were there were a better recording band than there were live performance band. I no, I I I just think like they 
I don't know. Just whatever they were doing, they just liked to party while they were playing. You know, no, that's I what I'm they saying. Were, that's they, what I'm saying. They they just went out there, had a good time. They didn't yeah. give a fuck about. They didn't. They didn't get. Yeah, they just did what they wanted. They didn't give a fuck. You're right. Yeah. Uh, so, but but they 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 were a band when they came to town. People would want to come see them. Yeah, of course. You know, you know. Now Sire Records was very persistent. Okay, and ended up they ended up signing the replacements. They had a few labels interested, but Sire was the one that they went with because. The band admired Seymour Stein, who was the founder, CEO. He had signed the Ramones, okay, and other bands, uh, so they liked that. And uh, he also, once he signed them, he recruited Tommy Ramone, who was no longer in the Ramones but was doing producing. Yeah. Um, he, he would produce their first major record label album called Tim, all right, Damn. that would that would come out on Sire in October of 1985. Another great album, kind of like its predecessor, Let It Be. Uh, Tim was was very critically acclaimed. Um, they made their first video for the song Bastards of Young. Okay. I don't know if you remember this video. It's it's a classic. It's it's just one shot in black and white of a of a, um, a speaker, a shitty speaker. No stereo. Oh speaker. yeah, I could, and, it, I, and, it, and it's just the bet you hear the song over it, and you see the, the speaker moving, yeah. and then at the at the end of the song, somebody kicks the speaker in. <laughs> I think I remember that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and uh, they ended up uh, getting some MTV time with that video. Okay, they were yeah. starting to get noticed on MTV. Um, other tracks on Tim, like "Hold My Life," um, "Swinging Party." Kiss Me on the Bus. Okay, that was a popular song. The band got invited on Saturday Night Live on January 18th, 1986 to perform Bastards of Young and Kiss Me on the Bus. Um, yeah, but they were the replacement for the Pointer Sisters. They were the replacement. They, yeah, yeah, yeah. They were actually, yes. Yeah, so it was kind of a joke. You know, the Pointer Sisters were supposed to go on. They canceled for some reason. And somebody brought in the replacements instead. So... That's that's the name. The that who are we going to replace him? The, the replacement. replacement. Who? What's <laughs> the name of the bad replacement? What? So who's going to replace him? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure they laughed about it. And, and <laughs> actually, before before the show, they were partying like crazy with the host Harry Dean Stanton. Okay, who was known to to party pretty hard, Harry Dean Stanton. Um, and uh, uh, Bobby. Stinson broke his, his guitar right before they were supposed to go on. And the, uh, the, he had to borrow a guitar from the SNL band, okay, to go out on stage and play. And during the, the, you know, during the, the songs, they were all over the place, sloppy, drunk. And uh, they ended up, like, cursing. Like you, like, you can see Westerberg cursing like he says motherfucker or something like that okay <laughs> and, and they ended up that was it you know they, they they got banned from the show forever and that was without a lot of money typical replacement <laughs> yeah now what yeah well that's what you got you got to replace the shitty replacement band that come on but uh paul westerberg would be invited back years later as a solo artist after the band broke up but the band never did play snl again um a few weeks later the band recorded a show at Maxwell's in Hoboken, New Jersey. Um, and it was professionally recorded by Sire for use on a possible live album. Um, this double live album, however, would not see the light of day until 2017. Okay, it never got released until then. And it was called For Sale, Live at Maxwell's 1986. Uh, and it was kind of like a, a really good document of where they were at that point. OK, uh, they were really about to, you know, break okay, um, nationally. But there would be some lineup changes right after that show. OK, when it was recorded, um, Bobby Stinson got fired from the band he started. OK, yeah, that's crazy. Um, yeah, and you know, there's there's different uh, different uh, stories with that. Um, if you remember Sonny Vincent, when we yeah. talked with him, he uh, he played with Bobby right after this time. 
Okay. okay? And uh, in a band called the Model Model Prisoners, I believe, um, and some other lineups. Um, they became very good friends. Uh, in fact, I did speak to Sonny today briefly. Uh, not today, the other day. And he's uh, got he's doing good with the Snake Pit Therapy album and everything. And we're going to review that. He's getting me a copy of it. So we're going to talk about that. So shout out to Sonny. Um, what, 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 well, you know, he had Bobby Stinson had drug problems. OK, drinking problems. So I guess that was probably a big part of it. All right. Yeah. But um, they ended up firing Peter Jesperson as well in 1986. OK, uh, the remaining three replacements carried on as a three piece to record the 1987 album. Please to meet me. Uh, it was recorded in Memphis with the famous Jim Dickinson. Uh, Jim Dickinson, if you remember, produced all the big star records in Memphis. OK, yeah. so they they kind of went back to their roots as a three piece, went down to Memphis where big star had you know done all their work. 15 years earlier, okay? Um, and they connected with Minneapolis guitarist Slim Dunlap. Um, he took over on lead guitar for these recordings, and soon he would become a full member of the band, okay? He took over Bobby Stinson's spot. Pleased to Meet Me did well. Uh, yeah. it, it peaked at number 131 on Billboard, okay, which was their highest selling at that point. Uh, sold about 300,000 copies. Tracks like IOU, uh, they had a song called Alex Chilton, which was Alex was the the lead lead singer and and uh, you know uh, founder of Big Star. Okay, yeah. um, so he, it was kind of a tribute to him. A uh, song called I don't know, um, I don't know. That was another one that was a favorite off that album. Um, they would ride high on the three hundred thousand and immediately go back in the studio and record again. Uh, the next album was called Don't Tell a Soul. Yeah. And they really, this album broke it for them. Okay. Uh, they had the big hit, I'll Be You. Okay. The, it was like, you know, you be me for a while and I'll be you. Remember that? Yeah. Okay. Good and, uh, yeah, it was. it's a good song. Uh, but it, the, the album was clearly uh, an attempt to go mainstream a yeah. little bit. I, and I, I get it. You know, it, it, I wouldn't call it a sellout album or anything like that, but it was really an attempt to be more commercial. Everything that was kind of commercial about them anyway, they focused on. Yeah, so they made it a little bit more commercial. because they, they, This was supposed to be like the big, big, like, here we are. Right. We're in right. your face. Let's do this. Right. Now, I mean, you know, Please to Meet Me is a better album. Okay, oh, yeah, of course. But, it's a way better but, album. But, it, you know, they were still, they didn't have a major hit yet, and I'll Be You became that major hit. Uh, now, despite this commercial upswing, okay, the band was in trouble. Uh, they followed, there was a disastrous tour that they had. They opened up for Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, and the tour did not go well. They were not well received. Um, they, Westerberg had just recorded some stuff on his own, he was thinking of putting out a solo record, but somebody convinced him to put it out as a replacements record. And this created a problem in the band because everything that he had, the musicians were mostly session musicians. It wasn't the band. Yeah. Okay. So all of a sudden there's a new album out called by the replacements and the replacements, the, the other guys were like, wait, what the fuck? Okay, with you, you know, know why they probably did that it was probably because they had to fulfill the uh, record aggravation. You know, they had to fulfill uh, the order. It, yeah, it might it might have been for that. That's definitely a possibility. I'm really I'm really not sure of the exact reason for it. Um, I it think Paul probably, went oh, we got a three record deal. You got to release this album to replace it. Or, or yeah, the I mean, Sire, Sire might have been pressuring them to put something out right away. Yeah, or maybe maybe it was like uh, you know just guessing. Maybe it was just the kind of stuff on there was probably more in the 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 I'll be you kind of sound, and maybe yeah. si you know Sia wanted that out. But the album was called All Shook Down. Uh, it got critical acclaim and praise right off the bat. Um, there was a hit song on it called Merry Go Round that did well. Yeah. Um, it topped the modern rock charts. There was a separate modern rock was another label that came out around that time. Remember? Okay. Um, but 
the album was all guest players, okay, guest session musicians and stuff. Um, this, when this album came out, Chris Mars left. Yeah, he They're was drunk. out. He was out right after it came out. He left the band. Um, but it, it's funny because it was probably their most well received commercial album. At that point, and they got nominated for a Grammy for it How as well. How incredible is that? The, yeah, that, that's you know, pretty but incredible. Band, yeah, I mean, this happens a lot. You know, bands start to get that little taste of commercialness, and they fall apart. Yeah. Okay, it's, it's sad it's when crazy. that happens. Yeah, a guy named Steve Foley replaced Chris Mars on drums. Um, that was in 1990, and the band ended up doing a tour with Elvis Costello in June of 1991. Uh, final show was at Madison Square Garden. Now, the band then decided to pack it in. Okay, they were going to quit. And uh, they did a short farewell tour that summer. They played what would be their last show for 22 years on July 4th, 1991. At, uh, it was called Taste of Chicago in Grant Park in Chicago. Uh, the show was billed as it ain't over till the fat roadie sings. And what they did was they played this. <laughs> you can see, you can see clips of this show on YouTube. They each member, like, you know, at some point in the show would leave the stage and their, their roadie, you know, guitar tech or, you know, whatever would come out and replace them. So at, by the end of the show, none of the replacements are on stage. It's all the roadies playing. Okay, that's pretty so, incredible. Pretty, <laughs> pretty, pretty definitely a unique way to hang it up. Um, this show was broadcast live on a Chicago station, WXRT. Uh, bootlegs became popular right away. Um, internet clips are still around today, like I just said on YouTube. You could check that out now. Um, Bobby Stinson, after leaving the replacements in '86, played in. Uh, local Minneapolis bands like Static Taxi and the Bleeding Hearts, uh, Model Prisoners, um, played with Sonny Vincent a few, in a few lineups. Um, after a lot of years of drug and alcohol abuse, he would pass away in 1995 at the age of 35. Okay. Tommy Stinson, his younger brother, played some short lived bands like Bash and Pop and Perfect. And then he got a great gig being the bass player for Guns N' Roses for many years from 1998 to actually 2016. Uh, in 2004, he released a solo album called Village Gorilla Head. And then seven years later in 2011, he released an album called One Man Mutiny. Uh, Paul Westerberg is a successful singer songwriter. He's signed to Vagrant Records now. Uh, he also has an alias he plays under sometimes called Grandpa Boy. Yeah. Okay. And uh, he signed to Fat Possum Records as 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 Grandpa Boy. Uh, his album um, in September 2004 called Folker, that came out, Folker, F-O-L-K-E-R, uh, kind of had a very early replacement sound. He kind of went back to that <laughs> sound a little bit. Now, Slim Dunlap kind of kept the low profile after the breakup. Um, staying mostly local in Minneapolis bands in that scene. Uh, sadly, he would suffer a massive stroke yeah, in 2012. Uh, it left him totally immobile. Now, Chris Mars works mostly as a visual artist these days. Uh, Steve Foley passed away in 2008 from an accidental overdose of prescription pills. Um, now, through the early 2000s, Rhino Records picked up their contract and got their whole back catalog re-released with uh, extra tracks and, and different takes and, you know, how Rhino does a whole complete... I love Rhino. Yeah. Rhino Records is great. Uh, in October, October 3rd, 2012, it was announced that Westerberg and Tommy Stinson were in the studio recording an EP of cover songs entitled Songs for Slim. And it was it was a benefit for Slim Dunlap, who you know was suffering from the the, the disastrous stroke that he had. Yeah. Uh, he, he, they, you know, he needed money. Um, they did a five song EP of cover songs on ten inch vinyl. It came out, and they only made two hundred and fifty copies of it, and they were auctioned off 
to raise money for him. Now, in August 24th and 25th, the replacements played their first shows in 22 years. Okay. And that was at Riot Fest in Toronto. Uh, they also played the Chicago and Denver dates of the Riot Fest. Uh, Dave Minahan was the guitarist from the Boston band The Neighborhoods. And they had a drummer named Josh Freese was brought in to, to play with the band. Uh, for the next few years, the replacements toured worldwide, played Europe a lot. Okay. Uh, they had several TV appearances. Um, I think they did a, I think they did a Letterman show. Uh, I don't know. I'm pretty sure they did. Um, in June 5th, 2015, though, uh, it was announced that the final show would be in Portugal. And uh, that they did their last show on that date. And there's been no further shows since. Um, Westerberg, wow. Westerberg has said, you know, there was a lot of rumors that that they were going to get back together and record an album, but they they might have, you know, there's stories that they did go into the studio, uh, but it just didn't work out for whatever reason. They kind of think Westerberg said, you know, we dipped our toe into it, we tried, but it just wasn't going to work out, so he he called it off. Um, yeah, I don't know what the future is for this band at this point. Um, I guess they they really they really not existent right now. Could they get back together? Yeah, I mean Tommy, Tom, you could have half the band, Tommy and and Paul. Okay. Yeah, so that's uh, pretty much that's pretty much yeah. it, I guess. Yeah, well, Chris Mars is still around if he ever wants to pick up drums again, but oh, he's yeah. not. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's a visual artist now. He's doing that kind of stuff. But uh, well, I'd love to see them get back together at least. A th at least the two of them, if not the three of them, and they could pick up somebody else on guitar. Yeah. You know. So that's wow, all that's, I got for you today, Rob. That's pretty incredible, man. From the but man, these guys would just get lumped up on stage. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but they put out some really important records. I think Let It Be, Tim, the first album, Hoot Nanny. I mean, everything, everything up to Everything up to Tim, I think you got to have in your record collection. You know, stuff after that gets a little spottier. I do, I do. I mean, I even like I'll Be You. All right. I think it's a good song. Okay. Uh, but their earliest stuff, you know, everything up to Tim, I think is you got to have in your record collection. Yeah. It's, cra it's crazy how, you know, what these guys took out like seven pretty damn good albums and yeah then they just break up or they just ride into the sunset you know yeah yeah it's such a and the career that it's funny that it's it's the 40th anniversary right right 40th of, anniversary uh, I mean, sorry mom forgot to take out the garbage the trash take out the trash <laughs> i love I that time that's a great name of an album yeah it you is know? it is so mike how can people um reach you if they want to uh, get in touch with you Okay. Uh, of course, I'm on Facebook under Rocco Mike. Rocco Mike. Um, we got the Facebook group page, the Rock Show podcast group page. Check that out. Join up. Um, I'm on uh, Clout Hub and MeWe as Rocker Mike. Um, also on Instagram under Rocker Mike 212. Rocker Mike 212 on Instagram. You can contact me there. Where can we get you, Rob? You could get me at anything getting lumped up. And I also um, want to give a big shout out to uh, Tales from the Dark for giving us a big shout out yeah. on a great episode of Giants. If you guys haven't um, heard of the podcast, uh, Bob Hicks and um, his girl, do Brittany, do a great job telling these crazy yeah. story. And um, just like uh, for next year, we'll be back on the trail of telling stories ourselves, uh, Conspiracy 420, which um, will start taping in uh, January. We'll start. Yeah. So well, we're going we're to have, change. actually, if you remember, um, in December, a couple weeks after this is aired, we're going to start doing some shows, uh, Conspiracy 420 shows on Giants, uh, the Nephilim. Books of Enoch, okay, the Bible, a whole bunch of weird stuff we're going to talk about for a couple weeks in a row. And then starting in January, um, every other week, we're going to have a rock show and a conspiracy show every other week back to back. Yes, so it should, it should be, be good. good. 
And anybody out there, I, I, I put up uh, on the Rock Show podcast group page on Facebook. Um, you know, we did this last year. I'd like you all to put down some suggestions, get in touch with me. Uh, I'm going to set aside four weeks starting in January uh, and March. So, so two in January and two in March uh, for, you know, any suggestions you guys would like to have us cover, any bands or artists you want us to talk about. Um, I'll take it all into consideration. We did that last year for the month of January. It was great. Um, and we're going to do it this year, too. We're going to have four weeks in the first three months of the year set aside just to fan requests, I guess you could say. And um, people, we are also now taking sponsors. If you would like to sponsor something, um, reach out to me at uh, Rod Rossi getting lumped up and uh, we'll talk a deal, a contract, because we are reaching a lot of people every day. We get about a few thousand downloads a day now, and uh, we're moving up in the charts, man. Like, you know, this is um, the, the getting lumped up universe is taking, um, you know, it's taking over. So, Yes, if you guys are interested in shows. advertising, we can send mm -hmm. us the product. We'll we'll test it, we'll use it, and we'll tell people if they should buy it or not. Yeah, and remember, we have the Rocker Mike and Rob present show where we interview people. If you got something really interesting to talk about, I, I, it doesn't have to be music related; could be anything. Uh, let get in touch with me. Uh, I'm on uh, Instagram, Rocker Mike Two One Two. Okay, you can you know direct message me there, or if you find me on Facebook, that's fine. Um, you know, we'll interview you. We'll talk about what you got going on. We've talked yeah. with everybody from you know musicians to people that believe in flat Earth. So yeah. you know, <laughs> we don't care. We'll talk to anybody if you got we'll an interesting anybody. story. We'll talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so people, we're going to leave you with the famous uh, saying. Don't get drunk. Get locked up. See you next week. Have a good Take one. Take care, people. The only podcast you will hear That will be music to your ears It's only here on The Rock Show